It's time. Time to get credit for the work you've done. Time to get the recognition you deserve. With Purdue Global, you can move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself. You're worth the investment in yourself to earn a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will respect. Purdue's online university is designed to support working adults like you who know it's never too late to accomplish your goals. It's never too late to make a comeback. It's time to start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. Have you heard about Vivgard, Fgard Tigamod Alpha FCAB? Ask your neurologist if Vivgard could be right for you. And learn more at vivgard.com slash learn. That's V-Y-V-G-A-R-T dot com slash learn. Brought to you by Argenix. AT&T believes that your phone is part of what makes you, you. So we understand why you're holding it as you go about your daily activities. Because truth, nothing should come between you and your connectivity. AT&T 5G is fast, reliable, and secure. And it keeps you connected to family, friends, fun, everything you care about. You'll enjoy fast speeds while you download apps, share your videos, or get your game on. All thanks to AT&T 5G. Requires compatible plan and device. Coverage not available everywhere. Learn more at att.com slash 5G for you. Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm Ray Arkins. I'm currently driving on my way to work in Los Angeles, California. Normally, I like to sit at my home studio, get a nice sounding recording for you guys. But, you know, sometimes the schedules do not permit that. And then I have to uh, record on the fly. But you know what? You don't necessarily care about that. As long as you're getting hopefully interesting conversations that you come to the show for a week to week basis. So anyways, this is the conclusion of the Faces of Modern Hardcore Month that I have been focusing on. Jump back a couple episodes, you'll be able to listen to some of the other interviews that I have done with people who I believe are doing important work specifically within the context of hardcore music. And this person is no exception to that rule. He is the rule because he works a crap ton. Daniel Fang, he is the drummer for Turnstile, He's the drummer for Mindset. He's the drummer for Praise. So many bands. He is so active, and uh, he loves it. It just came across in our conversation, and then me getting to know him otherwise, it's just awesome. It gives me so much pleasure to be able to bring this conversation and the fact that, uh, yeah, people are so engaged. I love it. I love it. So let's get some uh, housekeeping business out of the way and some other observations, and then we'll dive right into the conversation with Daniel. So please email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. If you have any feedback, if you have any future guests that you would like to hear me speak to, all that sort of stuff, I welcome it. I love it. And for those of you who have written in and have written some very, very heartfelt and introspective thoughts on the show, I'll get back to you. I promise. There's a few, a few of you who have written who have just, yeah, like I said, huge emails. And I promise I want to do them justice so I'm not just like two word responses for like 175. This past weekend, I got to go up to Santa Barbara, California, which is a beautiful coastal town. I have a lot of memories attached to that town um, for many reasons. One, because I dated a girl that lived up there. So I got to go to a ton of shows up there. There were, it, it's such a weird city because, so it's a, Santa Barbara is a college town, but then also it is a retirement community. And there's also a crap load of money up there. You know, like Oprah lives up there. Like, it's just a weird combination of all these things. But I remember going up there, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And I started to visit her a lot. And of course, I started to look around for shows, independent music community. And I got plugged into some of the amazing people that ran the Pickle Patch, which for those of you who are uninitiated, which is probably most of you because this kind of lives on in some people's history books, but has been kind of lost to time. The Pickle Patch was an amazing, amazing space. So what it was, it was uh, a lot of different people, but most notably, there's three people. Steve Aoki, who is now an internationally famous DJ, (laughs) which is funny to say that, but uh, yeah, and he was a hardcore kid and ran a record label. When I say was, he still identifies with it in some capacity. But anyways, 
I, I don't need to uh, talk about the identity of what people feel like they're attached to now. But anyways, so Steve Aoki, and there is my good friend Mike Mowry, who was on the show, I don't know, a couple months ago. I can't remember exactly when. But uh, he lived there, and there was this other guy named Andy, who I have no idea what his last name is, but uh, that's how I got kind of introduced to this, this community. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning all this is because, I mean, it was a beautiful place. Basically, it was a living room, and they put on shows there because clearly there is no place for many bands to play when they're going from Southern California to Northern California. And it was always like, well, where do you play? You play Bakersfield, which is, you know, honestly kind of a hellhole. So most bands do not want to go there. So Santa Barbara was perfect because it's like, oh, wow, I get to hang out on the beach and play a cool show. Maybe a hundred people would be able to fit in here. But I saw some incredible shows there. I saw Botch. So, I mean, I can't even remember all of the bands because I'd have to go back into my flyer database in order to figure that out. But anyways, I digress. Santa Barbara is just an amazing community, and uh, I love going to shows up there. So I was able to go see Sufjan, Sufjan, I don't know how you pronounce it. You, many people have said it different ways to me, so I've always called it Sufjan Stevens. Amazingly prolific indie rock musician. And um, I made, uh, there was a, a, a realization when I was watching him, and then I had a discussion after the show with my wife about people that present their music um, in theaters because this was basically at this place called the Arlington Theater there's around I don't know 2,000 or so people there completely sold out and it was such a wide swath of people there so it was like you know young whatever typical hipsters that you would see in Brooklyn or Silver Lake here in California but then there was also you know adults like people who were probably in their 50s that love what he does and then there was also younger kids like 15 year olds so it, it was just all over the place it wasn't you know one particular scene so I didn't really feel like I was at a show. Uh, it was more of a concert vibe, but regardless. So what I realized where it's like he, his performance in and of itself isn't exciting. He just gets up there, plays his songs, does what he does. I mean, granted, he's extremely talented because he plays guitar, piano, wind chimes, keyboards. He does a, he's a very, uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist, I think they call it. But needless to say, I, it, it, the, he had a beautiful light show. He had a lot of production put into this. When I say a lot, like you know, there wasn't, you know, pyrotechnics or anything crazy, but it was just, it was simple, but it completely fit the vibe. And for this style of music, it's so crucial for me personally to be engaged on that level. Because like I remember, gosh, it's almost two years ago, I saw this band called Wild Nothing. I love their records. I love what the band does. I saw them at the Glass House concert hall in Pomona, California, <clears throat> who it's, I don't know, maybe about 800 to 1,000 capacity venue, so smaller than the, this place that I went to to see Souf John, and uh, that band Wild Nothing was like watching paint dry. It was incredibly boring, because basically, you know, all they did was just get up and play their songs, and there was, you know, no real production value, there was nothing going on, and... I think some of us are spoiled that kind of come up in the punk and hardcore community because usually shows, whether or not you really necessarily like the band's music, are energetic, super engaging. You're watching kids sing along, you're watching the pit, you're watching all this stuff going on. But then obviously at a more subdued indie rock concert, you're not watching these things going on. So I've come to the realization that I have to wait for bands of this genre and ilk to reach a certain level in order for them to be able to invest in production and more of a, um, a more of a show rather than just like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna get my song, get up here and play my songs to you. Because uh, to me, that's just not, um, I don't know, incredibly engaging. Like of course, at the base value of attending a concert or show, I love the music. That's why you're there in the first place. But then it needs to really, really pull me in as far as the vibe is concerned so anyways I just I was curious if any of you have had those feelings as well where you're just like you know because you, you get into a habit of going to shows and then you start to not witness anything really special and that is kind of a, a shame you know and granted when you're 20 years old and you're playing in bands you're not looking to create an experience you're just trying to play your songs not mess up and have people you know push each other around maybe or sing along so, you know, I, I, I realize that. Like, I, I don't go to an independent DIY venue and I'm like, oh man, I want like a huge light show and I want all this going on. No, I don't expect that. But it's just an interesting thought that occurred in my head where I'm just like, oh yeah, maybe bands of this genre, I need to wait until they're in a theater before I really go try to see them. So anyways, 
if you have that feeling, I'd love to discuss it with you. Like I said, email the show. Anyways, Daniel Fang. <clears throat> we had a great conversation over Skype. And, um, yeah, because I actually got connected with him through my day job because uh, he himself is a vegetarian and or vegan. I can't recall. But uh, we started to discuss that because he wanted to work with me um, at PETA 2. And uh, I just was like, oh, man, this guy would be absolutely perfect for this month of shows um, just because he is so active. And he clearly cares about what he's putting into each band. It's not like he's just like, oh, yeah, the default drummer. Um, I even ask him that question. And he's like, well, no, I just like to be creative with my music. So anyways, without further ado, I've rambled on too far. Here's my conversation with Daniel, and I will talk to you after the jump. Break out the rage! Get back, just like that! No reason to call down! Step with the ones who stick around! Make your own I mean, obviously we met over email, and you were... Um, the thing that struck me about your, uh, you're, you're a very thoughtful person. Like, cause usually, you know, sometimes when people are, you know, writing to one another over email, sometimes it's just kind of like, you know, it's very short and sweet and maybe to the point, but uh, you were very eloquent. And I was, uh, I was like, wow, like this, this guy seems to have, you know, a, a good head on his shoulder, so to speak. Oh, I'm glad you think so. You know, not to malign uh, you know, hardcore in general, but, you know, sometimes a lot of people, um, you know, maybe don't place any real importance on, I guess, intelligence or, you know, <laughs> learning or anything like that. Um, yeah, I know what you mean for sure. Where, where does that kind of come from? Like, cause obviously, um, that seems like something that you have been interested in from just, you know, learning and obviously being educated, um, kind of in general, where, where does that kind of come from? I don't know. I, I guess it's an adopted thing, uh, through my family. Um, like, uh, my mom, is a lawyer and an avid reader like she's now uh retired and got her mfa in creative writing and um does fiction but she's the most avid reader i've ever met for sure and she used to read to me as a kid and just encourage um reading in all forms a lot and then on my dad's side my father is he immigrated from uh china during the cultural revolution um where his, his whole family was kind of persecuted because his father, my grandfather, um, was a scientist and a professor. Um, he was like an esteemed botanist at this, uh, this university in China. And of course, like that whole thinking, uh, educated class, um, were the enemy because, you know, they were the biggest threat to the government. So, they fled China and like ever since then, um, my whole dad's side of the family has put like a huge importance on, on education. Um, in which respect I've probably like dis- disappointed them a lot. Cause like I do music and right. tour and play shows <laughs> instead of like getting my PhD or whatever. But right. Yeah. I, I guess that's it. No. Well that, I mean, that's interesting. Cause yeah, I, you you can see the uh, you explaining those things it's like oh yeah like that makes sense because obviously there was a cultural importance like so what your your heritage is chinese and what what about your mother's side white very very white uh okay. like like multiple generations back in virginia so virginian and chinese got it yeah. <laughs> a chinese virginian I- <laughs> yeah that's got good. It. Um, but yeah, but it makes sense where y- you can see the, the, the through lines of, uh, the importance, like whether or not, like you said, you chose to go down a sort of, you know, educational path. Um, it doesn't matter because you're obviously still, you know, doing your best to obviously enrich yourself, just not in the traditional path. Yeah, I try. It's crazy. And, and hardcore music, um, I wouldn't have thought, but I've met so many people who've like not even graduated high school. Like they've gotten their, their GED maybe, but some of the most like innovative, intelligent, creative and eloquent people, um, who've just learned a lot through like, you know, the human experience for lack of a better term. No, that's, or, I'm, it, it, uh, there's definitely something that needs to be said in regards to, I guess the willingness to like learn and be curious because, you know, it's like, obviously if you go along the traditional path of, all right, you go to high school, you go to college, you maybe go to community college. And then, you know, then you're like, you know, birthed into the world where you've got no real idea of how to like handle yourself. Um, yeah. But then you, <laughs> because you're going through the motions, like you're not actually caring about this stuff. 
Um, as opposed to, you know, if you went to school at a later age and you're like, oh no, I like, I actually want to like be in these classes because of the, the, these are the subjects I'm interested in. And therefore you will be more dedicated to that as opposed to, you know, a 20 year old kid that's just like, dude, I don't care about this at all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, and seeing my, my peers in, in college as an undergrad blew me away because a lot of them were, were definitely just there because, you know, they're parents and society as a whole expected them to be. And I'm assuming their tuition was paid for and they were just definitely doing the bare minimum and going through the motions and not getting the most out of it. Not saying that I was like the most diligent student getting the most out of it, but I could at least like appreciate um, my time spent in school. And then the time I would spend touring during the semester and try to make the, the most of, um, of both experiences for sure. I remember I went to, uh, I went to college for one year at San Diego state and it was one of those things where it's like, you know, that school is a notorious party school. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I myself am straight edge. And so it was one of those things where it's like the people I was associating myself with were, um, you know, like <laughs> studies in school was like, you know, 99 out of a list of a hundred things that they cared about. Um, but it was one of those things where it was like, I was able to navigate with these people that I was, you know, essentially diametrically opposed to philosophically. But at the same time, we were all kind of in this weird thing together. And we all tried to, you know, I guess, pick each other up to where that priority started to, you know, bubble a little bit higher. Not saying on my account, but just like on the fact yeah. that you kind of bonded together. But it it is such a weird thing where people just view college is just biding their time. I got, I need four years to figure out what I need to do. That That's kind of like the, the thing about our generation, I guess. I mean, that's what I've read. And like, you know, when people like to write about a certain generation and like, uh, highlight their like observable ills, they're like, uh, yeah, this is a generation that just goes to college because that's another four years where they don't have to, to work and like they get, they get a break. They get to quote unquote figure out what they want to do and stuff like that. People like you and I probably take the idea of figuring out what you want to do for granted just because, you know, we get active within a music scene so early in our lives in high school or whatever. And, you know, we start to play shows in the weekends and tour and do all these things that people don't even think is a part of <laughs> a part of the world. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it's like, you know, on one hand, I, I'm I'm like, yeah, I understand it takes people longer to figure stuff out, but then it's like you can start in high school. Like you can figure stuff out that you care about. Then it's just a matter of like applying a, a principle of like, Oh, how can I make money off this thing? Like I love bike riding. How do I do that? It's like, well, how about you work in a bike shop? It's like, yeah, yeah. so, and it's like sometimes a kid wouldn't even put, the, you know, two and two together because they just wouldn't think of it like that. You know? Yeah, for sure. So you yourself, were you born and raised in the Baltimore area or where did you come up? Oh no. Um, I was actually born and raised in uh, Prince George's County uh, in Maryland, which is closer to D.C. Um, uh, so, like, give you a relative location. It's, like, 15 minutes from D.C. and then, like, 45 minutes to an hour from Baltimore. Okay. Uh, it was more of a um, suburb. Uh, I grew up in this town, Laurel, for four years and then moved to Greenbelt. Pretty much the rest of my um, my PG County stay and I, I went to a bunch of public uh, magnet schools, a great experience. I'm sure private schools uh, would have been um, very beneficial in a lot of ways. But I think from going to all these public magnet schools, I got a unique experience of being around so many um, different people like ethnically and culturally i had a very like diverse group of, of friends and and people um who i interacted with even though i wasn't super social in school um it was a great experience seeing people from like every major uh religion in one class and that doesn't sound important as a kid but growing up now i can reflect on that like if I grew up somewhere in like the center of the country, I might not even know what um, like Hinduism is or or Islam or you know something like that. Yeah, you would you wouldn't have the basic tenets of what these religions are based out of. You know, you maybe are familiar with the term just because it's spoken about, but not like oh, this is who their god is. This is who they. This is how they worship. That sort of stuff. 
Yeah, exactly. Just ex- exposed to a lot of things that I guess like ingrained a lot of, uh, hmm, not sure what to say, like, uh, just appreciation for, for different walks of life. And I, I could see like being the only like white person in the class being a normal thing where right? I went, uh, to college, uh, Baltimore County and everyone was white and it was like a movie. I was like, Oh, this is, this is how college is supposed to be. Everyone's white. And this is like a, a culture shock, yeah. which is like, which is America. So like, I guess it's a, it was a more like accurate representation of, um, of the demographic in which I lived. And, you know, I, I could, I could perceive a lot of things, uh, kind of like uniquely as someone who, who has like grown up around a lot of, uh, different ethnicities and people of different religions and being, um, like ethnically, ambiguous um in a sense myself like being half chinese but also like appreciate everything and and be very tolerant of of um you know different uh politics and and religions and ideals i don't know maybe maybe seeing things in a more balanced light as opposed to someone who might have grown up in like a predominantly white or left-wing or right-wing you know republican Hmm. democrat progressive conservative christian whatever you know yeah we nearly we nearly see one side it's definitely um a shock to the system when you get introduced to i was actually it's funny you say that i was just having a conversation with my wife last night who's a school teacher and she um one of her students recently went to brown university um and mm-hmm. this this is a guy who um actually i don't know his racial profile but he's he uh i know he's not white but it's one of those things where um, he, there were so many things that he just wasn't, um, accustomed to, like this is, he was going to high school in a uh, predominantly Hispanic area of here in Orange County in Southern California. Um, but it was one of those things where it's like, you know, he's seeing like gender neutral bathrooms and like all these things that exist now in our culture. But it's like, mm-hmm. I was thinking about it in terms of like, you know, just think of a kid in like you were talking about, like in the middle of Nebraska, that's like, you know, been raised a certain way, like you said, you know, whether it's religiously, you know, culturally, um, uh, politically. And then all of a sudden they see like a, a, a gender neutral bathroom and they're like, what is this? Like, it's such a, sh- it'd be such a, sh- <laughs> yeah. it'd be such a shock, you know, where they're like, I don't even know what that is. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And like when you're, I think it's human nature when you're exposed to something that different, no matter what it is, it's just like, it can almost be like revolting and how different it is. Like, how dare they? This is so not what I'm used to. So <laughs> totally. it's met with like adversity for, for no reason. You know? Yeah, no, totally. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Let me tell you, the holidays are awesome. They've got some great moments, whether it's spending time with friends and family, gift giving, all of the things. I personally love Christmas lights. Like I can't wait to put them up. It just makes me feel warm inside. But there are moments where it's like, man, it's overwhelming, or I'm feeling really alone or sad. All of the things that just, you know, can kind of compound it during the holidays. That is why you need to take a beat and maybe take that moment for yourself. Give the gift of time to yourself. And that's honestly why I love dipping into therapy. That's why I also love working with BetterHelp because they make finding a therapist online so dang easy. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Like I said, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, and then you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for any reason at no additional charge. Please, in this season of giving, give to yourself as well with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Ray to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ray for 10% off your first month. Take care of yourself, please. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles and Toyota has them with more on the way. But we also know a BEV is not for everyone, whether it's because of cost, range, or concerned about finding a charging station when you need it. 
Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future. In vehicles and in manufacturing plants, too. In the years ahead, the materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas-electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified, diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with a vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. And so, <clears throat> describe to me, because, um, I, I mean, I'm aware of magnet schools in general, um, and it's obviously such an important um, aspect to the Washington, D.C. area, but I know a lot of people don't necessarily, you know, maybe not know the term. So, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong any, anywhere in this, uh, in this sentence, but basically magnet schools are a public school um, that has a set of standards that are applied to the school and therefore applied to the students in regards to like maintaining a certain grade point average and that sort of stuff, or was it, uh, is it deeper than that, I presume? I certainly don't know the exact policies, how they were when I was in elementary school and middle school and high school and how they are now. But I think, yeah, that's sort of the basics of it. Also, um, they offer some kind of special programs, um, science and tech program or um, different extracurriculars and also like special instruction. So um, maybe like different, um, different kinds of teaching for for kids who are like ESOL or like have a learning disability um, or any other special needs. So it kind of caters to, to a wider variety of kids. So instead of just like kids going to the school nearest them in their district, they're drawn to this magnet school um, for whatever special um, needs or, or special incentives for their um, unique programs. And so and do, you, do you have brothers or sisters or what was your family makeup as you were growing up? Um, I had one older brother and um, he was uh, like four years ahead of me. So he was he was always um, in the next school because we, we went to like the same uh, elementary, middle and high school. So my parents already had like experience with uh, those teachers in those schools. And so you know, that they, uh, approved and endorsed all those schools. And, um, my brother like knew the teachers, some of the kids that were like a few years behind who I could interact with because, um, they were like a couple of years ahead of me. So I like go to, go to, go to high school with a couple of them. And, um, and that was cool. So like I showed up the middle school and showed up to high school already knowing a few people, the teachers already knowing my name, um, which is a good and bad thing. Uh, I think the friends part is cool, but then obviously the teachers, like, especially, you know, on one side of the coin, your brother may have been awesome and, you know, had perfect grades and then you were the exact opposite or vice versa, or <laughs> your brother was a troublemaker and they're like, oh, great. We got another one of the fang kids coming through. <laughs> yeah. It was actually kind of a mix of both. Okay. My brother's like super, super intelligent at that time was also kind of maybe a little bit of a troublemaker in, in some cases, but, but Yeah. It, it was a good experience. I, I enjoyed my, all my public schooling. Well, yeah, I know it's cool because I, I think a lot of the stereotypical sort of, you know, uh, punk, hardcore, whatever, independent culture experience is that you are supposed to be, uh, you know, on the outside looking in and you're that weird person who's just super into music and, um, you know, not, not going to school dances and stuff like that. Um, so I always like it when a person, you know, has a positive experience because usually the tropes of the story is like, oh man, I got picked on in <laughs> high school or whatever. It's like, well, not, not everybody's like that. <laughs> well, in retrospect, I like, I enjoyed it and I appreciated it, but no, I was definitely that guy. Like. <laughs> That's funny. So you, so like, you were, you, you were picked on, and people, you were the weird guy that was super into music. Well, 
I wasn't picked on. I kind of like knew a lot of people and it's pretty quiet. So I wouldn't embarrass myself too much. So I don't think I got picked on a lot, but I was definitely like kind of spent a lot of time to myself. I was like pretty like introverted, just focused on, on music in high school. And before then, like just playing video games and, and kind of doing my own thing, even though I did have a group of friends, I wouldn't like spend all my time after school hanging out with kids and like, you know, forming clicks and stuff like that. I was pretty much just in, uh, to my own thing and getting good at, uh, killing people in computer games. And what, what uh, I, I have to, I have to ask what, what sort of, uh, were you, what, what, what games were you playing? Were you a specific console person? Were you doing straight computer gaming? Where were you at? Oh yeah. I, I guess I was a super nerd because I was like strictly computer game guy. <laughs> Um, I play like uh, real time strategies like Starcraft okay. and uh, like sh- shooters like Counter Strike and Team Fortress and Half Life. And then when these started coming out, when this like genre was developed, I played the uh, massively multiplayer online RPGs like EverQuest and World of Warcraft and stuff like that. Sure. M- yes. M- M- MMOs, man. <laughs> yeah, the most deadly of them all for sure. The most addictive. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm in certain respects. I'm thankful that I, I mean, I'm 35 now, so I'm, I'm older than you. So I, I'm glad that that stuff wasn't as prevalent as when I was playing video games. Cause I, I don't know what path I would have headed down. Cause at this point I can't, I mean, I have a child of a wife, like whatever real life responsibilities, but like, so the video games I play are very much like I hop in and out. Cause like, otherwise it's like, Oh, 16 hours passed. And like, <laughs> where, yeah. where, where'd that day go? Yeah. It's just, it's a black hole. It's a dark path. <laughs> it totally is. Um, but it's, I mean, you, you, you mentioning that you were, um, you know, kind of r- reserved and introverted, um, that, I mean, not even knowing you, but just having the conversation with you right now, you definitely strike me as a person who wasn't like, Hey, I need to be the center of attention. Like, you know, I mean, especially like one could argue that obviously, uh, drummers, like no one pays attention to drummers in general. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like no one, I mean, people obviously, you know, I'm, I'm making an overgeneralization, but, um, you know, there's definitely that level of comfort where drummers can, you know, kind of describe their feeling of like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm blocked by a bunch of drums. You can hardly even see my face. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you ever made that correlation of just like, oh yeah, this is a level of comfort that I like playing drums because of, you know, I'm technically shielded from people. Oh yeah. If I mess up, it's nice to be in the back where I feel less vulnerable for sure. <laughs> totally. Totally. When, so when did, uh, when did independent music start to kind of infiltrate your, your life? Was that something that your older brother was into any kind of, you know, you, uh, through osmosis, you kind of gained that knowledge or was that something you were finding out all on your own? Oh no, absolutely. It was, uh, through my brother. Um, I guess I first started getting into the, the punk rock and alternative stuff I was pretty young, um, in elementary school, I think around 10 or, or 11, um, I'd start hearing a bunch of the stuff he was playing, like Rage Against the Machine and Minor Threat and Madball and Sick of It All, um, stuff like that, that he would like download, um, through like LimeWire and Kazaa and Napster and stuff like that. Um, so... I would have a lot of, uh, well, I got a, a good variety of like classic hardcore stuff, punk rock stuff, like rancid and, uh, more contemporary stuff. Like I heard like H2O and, uh, like, uh, hardcore bands from around the DC area. Um, and that just started growing. Like when I was in middle school, I started to get into it more myself, like instead of just hearing it through my brother. And I started checking out bands and downloading stuff on the internet and really getting into like straight edge. Um, that was just such an alluring thing at that time. Um, and a lot of the bands I listened to um, were straight edge bands. And then it wasn't until high school that I started actually like really playing music actively and uh, starting bands and really, really getting deep into the punk hardcore thing. Mm-hmm. Did you, did you immediately gravitate towards drums or were you also like fiddling around with the guitar as well, trying to figure that out? Um, in middle school, I guess I played bass. I like did like a, a, a talent show kind of thing where I literally just played an open E. I don't know what song just requires me hitting an open E. I was probably just playing it wrong and out of key. 
But I remember doing that and not having any further like knowledge or proficiency with a bass guitar. So <laughs> I'm going to just kind of count drums as being my first instrument. <laughs> sure. You, you quickly realize like, wait a minute, I don't think I'm cut out for this. <laughs> Yeah, definitely not. I don't even know if the bass was on. I was just—I remember standing up there, having a bass strapped to my body, and that's about it. That's so funny. I definitely remember. I, I love that logic. I, I like to call it kid logic, where it's like I remember I was attracted to drums as well, um, partially just because I was like, well, you know, playing video games, I got hand-eye coordination. I don't necessarily need to know notes, so like I can just kind of dive in and hit stuff. And so, like, yeah, exactly. And that's what I tried to do. And I mean, I failed miserably at it, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely that, that sort of kid logic where it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, ba- bass guitar, like there's only four strings. I could probably figure that out. More simple for sure. <laughs> totally. Um, and so then as you started to kind of, you know, dive in head first, like what was the, uh, were, were you the one that was kind of always instigating like starting bands? I mean, obviously being a drummer um, and I mean, obviously looking at the volume of output that you currently are involved in being in like 170,000 bands. <laughs> it, was it one of those things that was like kind of by default, everyone started to look towards you where it's just like, Oh dude, Daniel plays drums. Like, and he, he's pretty solid. Like let's get him to play in a band or were you the one kind of seeking people out initially? Initially. So I guess in middle school, I had a small group of friends who were like, vaguely interested in music and wanting to do something with acoustic instruments. I we didn't do a whole lot, but in high school I, I got together with my friend who was like really into to punk rock. So that actually resonated with me where he was not only into creating and playing music and into an instrument, but also into the same kind of music I liked. Um, so that really spurred like getting together, jamming like a ton of misfits and, and minor threat covers and and then writing stuff on our own and almost all throughout high school that was like the only um not until like senior year of high school where i started a more um i guess like serious hardcore punk band that like we actually play shows and tour a little bit um i start like playing actual hardcore shows and then from there um i would just go to shows all the time play tons of local shows in DC and Baltimore. And then I started meeting, you know, a ton of like minded people who are interested in music, interested in hardcore. And then from there, um, just kind of snowballed where I was like an active drummer. Um, and people wanted to start bands, people around my age, uh, I joined bands, like I joined mindset and then throughout college, uh, because I couldn't really like, commit to a band and like, you know, tour full time on an album cycle or something like that. I, I would just start, um, a bunch of bands, um, with my buddies and that's how I came to be in like seven or eight bands, um, throughout college. Two questions that kind of splinter off that. I'll focus on one first where, yeah. so once you're, um, well, actually three questions. First of all, what, what was the, uh, considering the names of people's first bands, I always find to be very uh, entertaining and telling what was the name of that sort of first project that you were putting together? Um, you know, the acoustic <laughs> thing that you were trying to do in, uh, in, in middle school, what did you guys have a name? Or were you trying to, uh, uh, and who were you trying to mimic? Um, well, that first thing, um, which I played bass for question mark, um, I don't, I don't even know if there was a name that okay. was just like a one, one get one hit wonder, you know, middle sure. school talent show kind of thing. But that, that punk rock band I play with, um, with my one friend was called Shug Clowns and, uh, Shug is, is my dog, my little Shih Tzu pug. Um, so they were all just songs about my dog Shug. Perfect. It's absolutely <laughs> appropriate. I, I'm sure he or she was in the room and you were just like, oh yeah, how about we call this Shug? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's probably pretty happy with the name. I can he's a Im- high self-esteem. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and so then, so the, as you started to really take a deep dive into this culture and obviously play in bands and be super active, um, like we were joking about earlier, I'm sure your parents were, um, you know, I'm, were they concerned? Were they just like, we're glad Daniel found something like, you know, where, w- what sort of, uh, uh, thoughts did they have towards this um, or if they were expressing anything to you uh, in regards to, well, as long as you stay in school or where was that kind of uh, going? It was uh, a combination of being fully supportive of something I was interested in other than computer games. Were they, were they worried about you? Like just 
like being complete, you know, being one of those cases you read about in the internet that, uh, you know, they never leave their room and stuff like that. Was that a real concern of theirs? Um, probably. I mean, yeah. I was a kid, so it's like somewhat natural, but also during like the advent of the MMO genre, there were like articles of people, like whole families playing and their dogs starving to death because they're just so preoccupied with the game that they neglect real life. Right. And so like, they might have like jokingly like showed me those articles. Uh, <laughs> That's but, funny. They're just like I could see them like you're you're in your room, doors closed. They like slip a print out of an article underneath <laughs> your door. Like, hey, read this, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing quite as heavy handed as that. <laughs> right. Um, no, I mean they, they've always been so incredibly supportive. Even when I was doing that, it was obviously like making me happy and making my brother happy because he would, he would play those games too. They saw something that would like actually give their child happiness and like at least some like drive to do something um, very intensely as a positive thing, even if it was something as like potentially toxic as playing computer games all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the music, that was the first thing I was like really into. I, I did martial arts in middle school and I was into that. Um, but then I, I got mono, like mononucleosis. I was really sick for a while. Um, and actually at the time, uh, the middle school I went to was not that great in terms like a, of a few teachers I had and their general uh, administration. Um, from what I understand, they were like sort of difficult um, to cooperate with, like me being at a school for, for a couple months at a time trying to get caught up on stuff and get all the material. And I'm sure um, I did a very bad job of like pulling my weight and, uh, and keeping up with the material. But anyway, at that point I was like home, you know, obviously like super um, fatigued all the time and kind of depressed because I wouldn't see any kids my age. I was just like sitting in my basement and um, laying in bed all day. So when I started getting into music, that was like, and out like that was something I could channel um, all of my free time, and my energy into and produce something, you know, like marginally productive latch onto as like this new, new thing. And, and I think my parents could see me like developing a passion for it. And so they supported that a hundred percent. And they like bought me my first um, like crappy little drum set. Um, let me, play in the basement, which is kind of unbelievable because I only recently found out how loud drums are and I don't know how my parents uh, put up with me playing acoustic drums in the basement like all day. Like I just didn't understand that they were that loud coming from the basement or yeah. you could hear it anywhere in the house. I have to thank them a lot for that. <laughs> totally. Any any parent that lets like their their sons or daughters perform in any capacity when it comes to music and most particularly drums, that's when you're just like, dude, hats off to you. It's like I yeah. I was the same like I the the bands that I played in, we practiced at our drummer's house and it was always one of those things where I'm just like I like, I, I want to go back now and just be like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry yeah. that we took up like four hours of your Sunday, like making horrific hardcore music. I apologize, yeah. but it's like, yeah, yeah. but that, you know, some parents are just like, well, like, like you said, they were obviously supportive over you. So they're just like, all right, well, this is, this is fine. Like we can, this is the new normal. You're, we're going to hear <laughs> Daniel uh, yeah. tripping around on drums downstairs. <laughs> We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles and Toyota has them with more on the way. But we also know a BEV is not for everyone, whether it's because of cost, range, or concern about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future, in vehicles and in manufacturing plants, too, in the years ahead. The materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas-electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint. 
with the vehicle that's right for you. A hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. Lucky Land Casino, asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. It's never too late. Never too late to earn a degree. Never too late for a comeback. Between your busy career and taking care of a family, it can feel like there's never a good time to go back to school. But your time is now. Time to start your comeback with Purdue Global. As Purdue's online university for working adults, Purdue Global is dedicated to supporting adults like you who know it's time to earn the recognition you deserve. You have the experience. You have the knowledge. It's time to get credit for the work you've done. You can balance work, family, and everything in between while earning your degree. It's time to move forward in your career, for your family and for yourself, with a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will recognize and respect. You're worth this investment in yourself to earn a degree you deserve. It's never too late, never too late to go back to school and come back stronger with an education you can trust. Now is the time for your comeback. Start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. And so it's, it sounds like, too, that you, you were, um, I guess, very pragmatic in the sense that, you know, you were, I mean, you weren't dropping out of school to be, you know, kind of have this sort of like pie in the sky mentality of like, I'm going to make it as a drummer or whatever. Um, so, so you were, you know, whether or not you were particularly engaged in school, you were still kind of going through it, knowing that that was valuable in some capacity. Or were you kind of being torn between two worlds where you're just like, I wish I could just drop out of school and like tour all the time. Where was your head at? Um, so when I did start like playing a bunch of shows like weekends and then eventually like one and two week tours, um, in late high school and, and very early college, um, I was thinking, wow, this is really cool, really exciting. Um, but I also appreciated school enough to not want to abandon it. Um, at the time I definitely disliked a lot of my classes cause I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to study, you know, especially in college where you have to pick a major and pick your own courses and all that. Um, I wasn't like thrilled, uh, about what was going on in school life, but I still generally, um, appreciated the experience and appreciated that I got to go to school when, you know, so many kids don't have that opportunity to go to college. Uh, I never had like a burning desire to drop out and just like follow this other dream. Cause I was truly appreciative of, of both opportunities, being able to play on the weekends and even take time off from school, the to tour, um, and also get a higher education. So, um, actually I think it was my freshman year, maybe my sophomore year, this band from Baltimore that I really, really liked at the time, something happened with her drummer, and they needed a new one and they asked me to join and they were like going on like sort of a world tour, um, immediately. So I was faced with the option of, um, of basically dropping at school or like, you know, taking an indefinite amount of time off and touring with this band that I loved. And I brought it up to my parents and they were like, wait, so you're going to tour like Europe and go to Australia and stuff like that. I was like, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have to not go to school for that. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. You should, you should do that. I would do that. And I was just blown away what how they could ever support dropping at a school to go tour in a hardcore punk band. Right. Um, I thought it was like reverse psychology at first. I was like, hold up, wait, what's going on? Like, <laughs> You're like, it's just not right. Am I being punked? Like what's happening? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and actually ultimately I decided against it for a couple of reasons. One being that I was in a couple bands with my friends, which were really small at that point and wouldn't do a whole lot, but I feel like, you know, that might've been the wrong thing to do because I didn't want to deny any opportunities for them if, if I was gone a lot. And then also I just, I just didn't feel good dropping out of school. Like, um, n- not like a guilt thing, but, I, I, I truly did um, value 
uh, the opportunity I had going to school, uh, especially at a school I liked. Yeah. yeah. You, I don't uh, know if that, uh, no, no, that's, I mean, I, that definitely answers, uh, or I mean, it doesn't answer the question. You're, it did answer the original question and kind of you threading into, you know, why you obviously didn't take that out. What, if you mind me asking, what band was it that the opportunity was presented? Uh, this band Ruiner. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Rec- <laughs> Without sounding too sort of uh, hyperbolic. I mean, that's a very uh, mature decision because I think most people faced with that um, would just react off the sheer sort of emotional punch of like, Oh wow, this is cool. I'm probably never going to get this opportunity again. You just being like, "Well, no, I got to I got to see this through." Yeah, yeah. It, it was a tough decision for sure. I never had to like really make a decision decision that would um possibly like, you know, lead me on a different path and kind of sunder my my current life. Uh so That was a big so one. That, yeah, it was hard, but ultimately I felt better knowing that like, okay, well, I'm going to stay in school. I'm going to keep learning, maybe get my degree. And in the meantime, I want to create things and start things with people right. um, rather than like, you know, kind of hopping on um, a train, so to speak. Sure. Well, yeah, no, that I, I, I like that point because it's like, yeah, you joining that thing that's already in motion, you know, that technically, well, not technically, that wasn't your own at all. So for mm-hmm. you being like, no, I can still do you know enrich myself as a human being by going to school but then also contribute creatively to all these other projects that i'm doing um hopefully that one day the opportunity will be afforded to me that i'll that d- will duplicate what <laughs> what the ruiner offer was you know yeah, yeah yeah definitely what were you uh what did you get your degree in uh sociology and anthropology and so kind of hit you know uh, focusing on the fact that obviously uh, a lot of the the bands you play in now, it's more specifically Turnstile. Um, to, to me, it, you know, and this is not to take away for the sort of work that you guys have done, but um, I'm sure it's just as surprising to you the amount of attention um, <laughs> that is being paid to your band currently as we speak, but then also over the course of the past like year or so. Um, and like I said, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, I personally enjoy your music and your live show is good, but it, it's just one of those things where it's like, you kind of start to witness something happening where you're just like, dude, how, like all these people are paying attention to this band. And like, I, I can't really put my finger on it per se. Like, does that make any sense? I know I'm kind of like rambling, but, um, Oh yeah, for sure. Because, and, and partially too, because you guys have always, uh, it, it seems to me the approach for Turnstile in general was always ex- like extremely casual where it's just like, Oh yeah, well like we're, I'm just, we're just making some music with friends. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people are paying attention to it. So is it weird for you to kind of like reflect on these moments of, you know, all all these exciting things that are happening for you guys? Um, yeah, I I guess point when I realized the bands were like, I guess like being received well, or like, you know, that people just liked them in in a general sense was when Angel Dust and Turnstile did our first like U S tour together, a tour with uh, twitching tongues headlining. And they, they took, took us out and it was like the first time our bands have like been to California and Texas and all these places um, where we've never played because we've only done like little weekends and stuff like that before. Mm-hmm. And the shows were, were huge and um, the reactions were really crazy and people were really excited um, about the records and merchandise and stuff like that. Um, and it was definitely cool and, and, and surprising because yeah, like you said with, with both of those bands, for sure, the approach has always been, we'll just make whatever sounds pleasing to us and we'll just create things that are aesthetically pleasing to us. And it was not like trying to fit in any, any like specific kind of subgenre or appeal to any specific kind of demographic. So yeah, I guess it was sort of a surprise and definitely a really cool feeling because it, it, was, it was sort of like, this is this music and, and these bands are purely a reflection of like what we like and we're just doing it because we really enjoy it and not trying to uh, pander to anyone, you know, that, that people like that, that was kind of a cool affirmation of, um, of us just doing something for a cool reason, people being into it and feeling like very accomplished and that, um, it was a very pure, process of creating something that came to light and like became something very real 
Mm -hmm. No, it's a very good point. I mean, I definitely think that they're, um, I think the, uh, culture in general, and I, I'm heartened by this, seems to appreciate authenticity. So it's like when people are expressing their true emotions or true, true creative voice, whatever it may be in movies, art, whatever, um, it tends to attract a wider audience than one may have originally anticipated. Um, so I think that's totally a reflection of why Turnstile um, is where it's at. Uh, I think the thing, the thing that's always uh, interesting for me to watch, and partially just because I've worked in the music industry for such a long period of time, that when I feel people that uh, honestly aren't necessarily attached to the scene that you and I have come from um, mm -hmm. start to be like, hey, have you heard that band? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, how, how the fuck did you hear about that band? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, I, and I know, and I know that's happened for you guys. So, um, it's, it's, I guess that's the, the point I was trying to make where it's just like, I'm sure it's weird to be in this, this position where it's just like, wow, we have all these labels coming at us and like all these, these sort of weird business things that was never on our radar. And then now it is. And now we have to kind of navigate the weird water of like being this, you know, funky hardcore band. <laughs> like where, yeah. where, where do we sit? You know? Oh yeah. That's yeah, absolutely. Like when we started seeing articles in like the Washington Post about turnstile that was totally from left field that was weird and brennan did an interview for the new yorker and that was totally weird that's like definitely something i'd never think of being you know involved in playing in a hardcore punk band having something about us um published in the new yorker and yeah like tweeting about us and like different bands on the internet saying they like us like yeah, like what's rock bands and yeah, stuff give, like give, that. Give me an example of the one, like, you know, maybe one or two anecdotal things that you personally remember where you were just like, what? Like, that's, that's wild, you know? One, one is, uh, Haley from, from Paramore. That was kind of a shock because I, I love Paramore and see him as like this awesome pop oriented band. Um, I've liked for so long and her liking Turnstile a lot was really cool and meaningful, but mm -hmm. I also know, you know, how she heard the record. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, She's attached to someone who may or may not be familiar with the hardcore scene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I guess that's not so much of a shock. No, but, but still, still, it's but crazy. It, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it, and especially, like, it, it's one thing if a, a person like her uh, heard the record, like, obviously, like you said, you know how that happened. But for her to proclaim to her Twitter followers, like, hey, Turnstile is great. It's like, well, what? Like, she didn't need to do that, you know? So kind of, you know, splintering off that, it still seems like obviously the attitude you approach, like basically all your bands with is very much like, we'll be, we'll be active when we're needed, if that makes sense. Like, you know, cause you obviously see a lot of bands go through the, the struggle of, you know, being out for 300 days out of the year. And then, you know, two years into it, they're super burnt out because of the grind that it is touring. Um, so I, I presume like a lot of the approaches of, of the bands that you're in are, are very intentional in regards to like the level of activity. And like, do you like that sort of, um, I guess, like the, the the fact that you can be in so many bands is uh, indicative of the fact that you're not like every single one of them isn't a full time touring thing. So, like, I, I'm sure you yeah. appreciate that, and that's intentionally set up as such. Yeah, to an extent, um, some limits on touring and stuff like that are uh, also just circumstantial because, uh, like, in mindset, uh, everyone has like a career. Mike for mindset got married and is about to have a kid. So like there are obviously like more important things going on where like, you know, a two week tour is not worth like not being uh, at home for Christmas with your newborn child. You know, a lot of perks um, of being able to like do a couple bands where an incredibly um, important force in everyone's lives and they mean a whole lot. Um, but we're also not expecting to like tour full time, put out, um, an album and then do like four months of touring on it. We can just play a few shows and have them be meaningful shows, um, and get the most out of it while everyone in the bands can focus, um, on other important things in their life. And then with Turnstile and Angel Dust, um, fortunately we do get to, to, to tour a lot, um, because pretty much everyone in the bands are, um, like fully um, dedicated to to making themselves available to doing whatever is necessary, but like you said, um, we also do place like a high importance on like doing tours that we definitely enjoy for 
every reason um, that you'd enjoy a tour. Like it has to be fun. We just like to tour with our friends' bands. Um, like to tour with like um, new and like exciting bands. Don't like to do it too much because we're not playing shows for the sake of playing shows and for the sake of like, you know, supporting this or that we do it cause we love it. And there have been instances where we've turned down, um, really cool stuff just because it was too much. Like maybe we get burnt out and, um, you know, it, maybe it's just not the right thing for us at that time. So fortunately we've had, I guess we've had like the prudence to, to make, um, our time spent playing shows count and then, you know, not overdoing it, not tiring ourselves out. So it can continue to be something that we really, really love. And so it doesn't turn into just a job, you know, it's a very, yeah, I I think it's, I'm really encouraged by bands taking that approach more so now in the past, like five or six years, because I definitely think that was, um, that was not really an option for bands, you know, prior to that, because it was the, yeah. the notion of like, Oh, we got to do this in order to, uh, you know, be successful. And now that the paradigm has kind of shifted to where it's just like, well, you can do this. Like, you know, realize that you're, you know, whatever, you're going to have to work at the bagel shop when you're home. But like, as long as yeah. you're still like productive and enjoyable, like you can maintain that, that lifestyle and still, um, enjoy what you're doing and not, yeah, kill yourself and, you know, bur- burn out too quicker, too fast. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's awesome. Would you, uh, because you are so active in so many bands, would you, uh, you know, cause I, I look at a person like that and I would be like, oh yeah. So like they get bored a lot. So that's why they're playing in so many bands or whatever. Um, yeah. Why is it, is it just one of those things? Is that the case or is it, you just obviously like to be, um, you know, uh, active in so many things because, you know, even though all the bands that you play in kind of, you know, fall under the whatever umbrella of hardcore, they're all pretty distinctly different, um, so is, is, is that it? Or is it just like, Oh man, I love being active. Um, no, I mean, I wish I had more time in the day. I wish I had more days in the year so that I could play with so many more bands. So many friends, one of my friends' bands that are doing really cool and interesting things. Like I love all the bands that I'm in, um, like writing and recording and playing shows uh, with the bands and obviously like hanging out with all my best friends that play in these bands. Um, and so I'm very actively uh, pursuing new and cool and interesting things um, with these bands because it, it's all very worth it. Um, yeah, I, I, I've never really felt that I'm just like going through the motions or whatever. Um, never felt bored and that I have to compensate by like playing a show. I, I actually just I hate practicing with bands. Like I hate rehearsing. I hate the idea of like playing a show that won't be um like truly like gratifying and won't be like a cool exciting show um i never want to play a show that is a show just uh you know play in front of people i want to do stuff that um that that excites me and excites everyone in the band and um i want you know things to to feel fresh and meaningful Mm -hmm. um and now obviously that that you uh you know are are more settled in the fact that you are in touring bands and there are exciting things happening. Is, is it one of those things that you, um, your relationship with your, your parents, like they're, uh, proud of what you've accomplished, I'm sure in certain respects, like they may like, do they go to your shows when they, when you come through, like where, where's their sort of level of appreciation, uh, in regards to what you're doing? Oh yeah. It's, it's been a while since they've been to shows, but well, they, they've always been super, super supportive. Um, uh, this is probably like a classic thing, but when I was in like the Washington post and the, our bands were like in the New Yorker um, and stuff like that, that's when they feel like really proud. Cause that translates more to like, I don't know, an, an image or reflection of success or accomplishment rather than saying, Oh, I just got back from a tour. It was sick, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, It's like, I would equate it to you saying like, dude, we played really late in the afternoon at this is hardcore versus like, (laughs) Hey, Hey, we we had a, we had a paragraph in the New Yorker. It's like the New Yorker is a, you know, a cultural zeitgeist thing as opposed to this is hardcore where they're like, what's that? (laughs) Yeah. Well, actually that's interesting. My parents um, have been going to this is hardcore for the past like five years or something like that. That's amazing. Um, I don't know if any other parents 
um, go that frequently, but they go and like watch at least one of my bands. Cause it's always like multiple bands uh, playing. This is hardcore. Mm-hmm. And then they'll, they'll do like um, Philadelphia stuff. Like go to the Franklin Institute, go to, go to another museum, you know, get some good food, stay at a cool hotel. So yeah, that, that definitely shows how um, supportive they are. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Yeah. They're like, Hey, yeah, we'll, we'll make a weekend out of it. You know, we'll, uh, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll pop in, watch our son play this, this really weird hardcore festival thing. And then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go get some more culture. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's cool. They really enjoyed their, their first time. Cause it was like, I guess a little bit more of a shock because it's different than like the local Baltimore show at the charm city art space. It's, uh, it's definitely like, grand. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely like more grand and, they met a few people. I remember my mom was standing like in the center of the pit before mindset started this one year. Like as we were like about to start the first song, this guy came over and said, um, ma'am, like before, uh, this band starts playing, you might want to get out of the way. Cause people are going to like start moving around and it might get dangerous. And then he like kind of showed my mom to the edge of the pit and then just stood there and guarded her the, the whole time. Everyone was super polite um and chivalrous apparently and uh she was like super impressed and that's amazing that's yeah like, i mean that 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 almost gives me well not almost that gives me chills because it's one of those things where it's like you don't uh you know people obviously tend to focus on the negative things that happen in the context of well i mean basically life in general um because it's obviously more exciting to talk about but like those sort of moments are are um yeah, they're, they're rare that people speak about that. So that's awesome that your mom had such a positive experience and people like, Oh yeah, we gotta, we gotta take care of the mom. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was really happy to hear that. I was, uh, you know, if that reflects anything about the, the hardcore punk community. Yeah, no, that's definitely encouraging. Um, the last thing I want to hit on before uh, I let you go is the, uh, you know, the idea that, um, you've obviously stayed engaged within sort of your, um, your, your pursuit of knowledge and obviously becoming, uh, you know, more aware of, uh, social movements, um, you know, activism, all that sort of stuff. Um, because I do think that that is, um, well, it's something that's still important to punk and hardcore. It definitely kind of ebbs and flows, um, and goes through its peaks and valleys where right now I feel like it's kind of in a, you know, maybe in a little bit of an upswing, but it's definitely on the lower side of things. Yeah. Um, so is, I guess what, what makes that important to you where it's like, okay, this, this style of music that I'm playing needs to have these threads of, um, you know, change or political messages or, you know, talking about vegetarianism, straight edge, whatever it is. Um, you know, what, what kind of keeps you, uh, wanting to sort of push that agenda? The same things that, that got me interested in music and that have kept me interested just that inherently, um, hardcore and punk is a very passionate thing. And it always should be. Um, it's not like easy listening music. It's not pop music created to, to cater to like all walks of life. It's, it's supposed to appeal to people who care about something. It could be about, um, you know, like, uh, straight edge vegan, uh, politics, or it could be about something, um, way more introspective about dealing, you know, with like dark feelings or, or whatever. Um, I feel that it's always important to speak about something and you know as a drummer i can't actively do that on a microphone but i'm i'm really proud and really happy to be in bands with people who are like-minded and um push an idea of straight edge or vegetarianism um will push an idea of the fact that uh hardcore punk shows tend to be more male centric and that it's almost appalling how how little uh, females have the chance to be involved. Um, like I, I remember just a few years ago, it was more of a thing where girls wouldn't be up front at shows, like singing along, getting in the mosh pit because maybe they'd be embarrassed because people joke about that stuff and, and say, you know, girls aren't supposed to be stage diving and mosh pitting. And now it's, it's, it's encouraged a lot just so people can actually feel uh, equal at this like radically progressive, um, environment of a hardcore show where you should, you should never be, um, 
should never be belittled or made fun of because you're some sort of minority and you want to get involved like everyone else and take the mic and express yourself like anyone else. I'm, I'm really happy that in the past few years at a, at a lot of shows, um, girls would come up and, and take the mic and sing a part and do a front flip off stage and kick someone in the face <laughs> because that's what everyone's entitled to do at a hardcore show. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so hopefully these things um, make a change and continue to make changes and just push ideas of, uh, of what this hardcore punk idea is supposed to represent, which is, you know, independent thought and embracing new and interesting ideas and practices and putting it all in one expressive, cathartic package of hardcore music and a hardcore show. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it, it's it, it's exciting to to see um, you know diversity spread across. Um, you know, it, the, the longer you get involved, the realize the the more you realize how much has changed. You know, it's like it, each year that passes, it get you know, it, quote unquote, it whatever that it may be for some people, it gets progressively better and better. And it's just it, it's exciting that that ball continues to roll because I think again, people tend to focus on the negatives and it's like, well, why hasn't this changed yet? And it's just like. Dude, yeah. like every social movement, no matter what it is, takes a long time for people to adapt to. It's like, you know, look at civil rights, you know, gay rights, like every animal rights, like every single thing. It's like, it's better than it was 10 years ago. And like, not to say that it should be a cop out where you shouldn't keep trying, but you just need to keep it in perspective. Cause I think, I mean, everybody wants stuff to change immediately. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's, that's almost next to yeah. impossible. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. There's no reason to be, uh, pessimistic or even cynical about the the progression of um of hardcore or you know a lot of social movements um that can be observed in american society and and abroad um yeah. because there has been enormous change in a lot of areas for sure yeah definitely well daniel i really appreciate you uh hanging out and uh, chatting it up with uh with me on this uh this fine afternoon and uh hopefully you didn't take offense to any of my questions <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not thank you for having me <laughs> yeah no problem. of course dude there you go there's my discussion with daniel i'm almost at work now guys isn't that great Lo- love the uh, commuting life fortunately i only have to do that like one day a week and that's why i can bring you these shows with such regularity so anyways the producer, as always, for this show is Tom Richfield. And you know what? I just realized I don't know his middle name. I was about to say his full name, but then I'm like, I don't know his middle name. So I'm going to say Tom Michael Richfield. And if I guess that correctly, then, uh, wow, I guess I'm clairvoyant. But anyways, email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Please review the show. Uh, I know I haven't been bugging you about this, and it's my fault. But uh, if you listen to the show on a semi-regular basis, please review it, because I've, I, I need some validation there. I haven't got a review in a while, and I, I would like that. And those reviews help the show get ranked. It just helps out the show. Until next week, which I've got some more great shows for you. I just the, the, Even though this theme month has ended, there will be no shortage of quality drop-off in a conversation. So... Anyways, until next week, please be safe, everybody. Have you heard about Vivgard, Fgard Tigamod Alpha F Cab? Ask your neurologist if Vivgard could be right for you. And learn more at Vivgard.com slash learn. That's V-Y-V-G-A-R-T dot com slash learn. Brought to you by Argenix. I have diabetes. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. I have asthma. I'm at risk, too. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD, or heart disease, or are 65 or older, you are at increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. Ask your doctor or pharmacist about Prevnar 20, pneumococcal 20-valent conjugate vaccine, a Pfizer vaccine that can help protect you against pneumococcal pneumonia in just one dose. Even if you've already been vaccinated with other pneumonia vaccines, Prevnar 20 may help provide added protection. Prevnar 20 is approved for adults to help prevent infections from 20 strains of the bacteria 
that cause pneumococcal pneumonia. Continued approval may depend on a supportive study. Don't get Prevnar 20 if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or its ingredients. Adults with weakened immune systems may have a lower response to the vaccine. Side effects include pain and swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, and joint pain. For full prescribing information, please call 1-855-213-2138 or visit Prevnar20.com. It's football season, and you can now get almost, almost anything you need for game day delivered with Uber Eats. What do we mean by almost? Can Uber Eats deliver foam fingers? No. But chicken fingers? Yes. Touchdown dances? No. Buttermilk ranches? Yes. Field goals? No. Grilling coals? Yes. There you have it. Get almost, almost anything for game day delivered with Uber Eats, official on-demand delivery partner of the NFL. Order now. Product availability may vary by region. See app for details. Get almost, almost anything for game day delivered with Uber Eats.